Okay, our next speaker is here. Rosilena has some more uh, of 10 years of experience uh, in marketing and communications. She is also uh, also blogger who uh, writes about uh, growth, digital strategy, and marketing. Um, she also loves cats and uh, stickers, but uh, uh, I think that she's not gonna tell us more <laughs> about them today. Uh, and I think Hey guys, whoa! That's one awesome screen, by the way. I, 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 I feel that that's the biggest one I've presented in front of. I don't want you to think about anything else on that one. Um, so hi, my name is Vasi. Um, it's shorter, easier. Vasilena is the official name that my mother uses when I've done something wrong. And today I'm going to talk to you about ways to understand your audience better and ways to understand what would they found, find truly valuable. So you can uh, plan your strategy, plan your messaging, or help your clients in doing those same things. So what we usually do as marketers, because I'm one, when we get a question about, okay, like, what's your target audience? What most often happens is that a person sits down, possibly in front of the window, or staring at the wall if their desk is in a shitty position in the office, and they start thinking about, okay, what would my ideal customer be? And I'm going to tell you today that that's not the way of doing things right. I think that what we can do is actually be more scientific about it, and if not looking at the petri dish, actually looking at our users and talking to them, and in that way understanding better what uh, they're all about, who our users are, who our potential target audiences, if you're writing a blog like me, or what you can offer in terms of features or in terms of messaging for your product if you're a product-led company. So, I'm a big fan of data, and I think that the best way to get a grasp of your audience is to use data to your advantage. And there are a lot of ways you can do that, so I'm gonna share a couple of my favorite ones. Um, I'll be running through it fairly quickly, so if you're not up to speed, I'll share your links to the slides at the end of my talk, so don't worry about that. So the first thing that you can use is Google Analytics. Google Analytics is uh, a solution if you already have a site, duh, obviously. But it can give you a lot of interesting information in terms of what your audience composition is. It allows you to see all of these interesting things like a uh, person's gender, their age, their location, their interests, and the technical devices pattern uh, in, on the people who come to your site. And I'll tell you why that matters in it. So, first off, obviously you would get these funky reports telling you that like male audiences in the ages of 25 to 34 are your biggest potential market. But that's not the most interesting thing. The most interesting thing is looking not only at how many people from a specific group are coming to your website, but how um, they are interacting with your website and what's the quality of that audience. So here's an example. That's a screenshot from our own analytics at Enhanced, the company I work for. It's a startup focused on creating a resume you'll be proud of and helping you show your true self in front of potential employers. So I can talk to you about that later. But what we see here is um, a disposition of the number of sessions. So I've blurred out the numbers here, but you can see, okay, we have like French people coming through the site at 9%, and then Polish people here all the way to the bottom of the top 10 at 3.9. But what we can see further there is that actually, those three are our most lucrative potential clients in terms of people creating accounts on our platform. So you can see way over here that these people are converting much higher than the rest. 
So what we can do in this situation is say, okay, we're definitely going to focus on the French folks and draw an additional volume there. But what we also want to see is how we can get people from Poland and get more people from Poland coming to the website because they obviously derive value from our product. And that's some very helpful information if you are doing targeting or if you are doing your marketing. Then what we can also see is the same thing in terms of gender. You can look at the behavior of people. You can see that here female users are actually more engaged with the website. But you can see that the male audience is spending more. And that's uh, because in this particular case, that's an e-commerce shop uh, focused on um, providing gift vouchers. I'm guessing that the guys have uh, done a lot more bad stuff and they need to apologize with more expensive products. But that's completely like a hypothesis based on my personal experience and not something I can derive from the data, of course. Then what we can also see are the interests of those people. And you need to keep in mind that Google uses some pretty finicky ways of uh, getting that information. They're basically <coughs> looking at your um, behavior when they are, um, when you are logged into your Google account and what is the pattern of your behavior on other websites as well. And they can tell you first of what you're interested in, which are affinity categories, and then what type of stuff you are looking to buy as a user. And then on the other hand side, you can see that for your personal website. Just a word of caution here, as I mentioned, that's based on the behavior of the person. So in my personal Google account, it says that I'm very interested in marketing and tech conferences. I'm very interested in cats. I mean, every person needs a body. I'm very interested in like all the girly stuff like makeup and like fitness and whatever. And I'm very interested in first person shooter games. I'm guessing you can spot the other one out. And the reason for that is because we have a tablet at home and the YouTube app is logged in with my personal account. And my partner watches streams of Counter-Strike when going to bed at night. So, yeah, you know, just take that with a grain of salt. But uh, what you can also see are devices used by the audience. And again, that would be interesting to look at what's the different behavioral pattern there. And we can see here that people who log in on a desktop are much more active and they're uh, buying much more often. But people buying on a mobile device are to have a higher average purchase cost. So what this tells us is that people in a hurry who need to buy on the go, they're not so price sensitive for this particular case. So you can look at what the differences there are. The next favorite thing of mine is what we call Facebook Audience Insights. So that's a platform that you can use even if you're not actively advertising on Facebook to see uh, what's the audience conference position either of your own personal audience, if you already have that channel, or, and where it gets much more interesting, when you're still thinking about developing something or creating a product or creating a website focused on a specific target group. So here's an example. I took to survey like what's the typical Bulgarian audience of entrepreneurs, and here's how that works. Come on. We tried that in the morning and it worked then, but I'm guessing that my computer is getting a bit shy now. So let's see. There we go. So here I'm putting in the location of Bulgaria, and I'm also putting in interest entrepreneurship. Obviously for a real life situation, I would put more interest to just narrow down the audience. And you can see that it's more male-oriented than the average on Facebook. There's a lot of single people who are interested in entrepreneurship. They're better educated than the average on Facebook for Bulgaria. They're much more likely to be in IT and computation or like computer science or whatever. 
And we can also sort that out based on the total composition of our own audience, which shows that a lot of people are in sales, and that's a good skill to have as an entrepreneur, I guess. What you can also see is what they like. For example, what media they go after, or anything else, like what uh, specific charity causes they're uh, following and what they're focused on. Here you see South Bulgaria. Or even what uh, you should serve at a networking cocktail event when you're doing that, or where you should stage that. And you can see a lot of interesting information here that will give you an idea of what your audience actually looks like. And what you can also see is how engaged that audience is, if you already have your own personal Facebook page. What you see here in gray is the actual composition of your page, and in blue you see uh, what percentage of people who are actively engaging with your page, so liking, commenting, um, sharing, clicking on photos, all that kind of stuff. Uh, how different they are than the average uh, composition of your page. So here you see we have a lot of people in 25 to 34 in terms of total audience size, but they're much less likely to engage with the page than say the older demographics here. So again, coming to that same topic of not just how big that specific target group is in terms of audience size, but also how active they are and how interested they are in what you have to say. And I mentioned earlier that the technological profile can give us a bit of more uh, insights in the audience. And the first thing was what I showed in terms of shopping on the go and shopping in front of the desktop computer. And here's something different. Uh, showing you, giving you a basic idea of what's a disposable income based off on what mobile devices the people are using. So I'm showing first here an example of a pretty <coughs> ordinary page in terms of audience composition. That's um, our page for a uh, popular science event I'm involved in or organizing. And you see that the split is pretty even, but there are a lot of people who are focusing on content on computers. And here's a second example of people who are interested in luxury design. And you see here how disproportionately huge the percentage of iPhone users is. And you can already glean at the fact that those people have much more money on average and are interested in, uh, well, I'm not going to say better design because there's great Android phones out there, but better design. The same thing, but if you're focused on in a B2B um, type of audience would be LinkedIn. What they have is something called LinkedIn website demographics, which lets you put a uh, tracking pixel on your website through a short snippet of code and then LinkedIn is trying to match the users coming to your website with the users who are currently logged into their LinkedIn. So it gets a bit slower, it's not going to give you results right away, but the information can be super valuable if you're uh, focused on the B2B side. So if you're running, say, a website development agency, you can see what types of companies come to your place and you can then better serve them and create solutions or case studies focused specifically on these audiences. So you can get all sorts of information from company name, specific company names, like spoilers it would show at the top like Microsoft and HP without variation or something like that. So focused on bigger companies. But you can also look at company size, you can look at the industry, at the role of the people within their company. So you can see if the people coming to, again, I'm going to give that example to website uh, development agency, you can see if the marketing person is the first contact or the person doing the, the surveying of solutions, or if it's a developer and you can vary your language based on that. You can see their seniority and their location. So here's how that looks. So you can, you can get from that drop-down menu the specific information you can choose, like here is job seniority, and I've split that here, or you can use any of the other ones I showed you. But once we've looked at the general like demographic information, we can first of all get a lot more personal. 
and then get much more under the skin of our potential users. And what I'm going to show you here creeps me out a bit, to be frank, but it's a solution that you can use and you can check and you can try to use it for good to understand your users better and to understand how to communicate with them uh, in a better way. So what we're going to talk about is psychographics. So how many people here are familiar with psychographics? Can I get a short show of hands? Okay, so psychographics is um, basically understanding your users not from the viewpoint of their age, location, those like demographic factors, but from the point of view of uh, what they care about, what motivates them, what they're trying to achieve, uh, how risk averse they are, and all of these different psychological aspects that you might want to get a better understanding of. And there's a tool called Crystal Nose that you can test out and see that. It's here we go on a personal level, so you need a specific account of a person you want to survey, so you can do it with current customers you have or you can do it with potential leads you have. So here's how that works. It's uh, a Chrome extension, so you install it. It shows that view personality thing on the right hand side and it gives you a complete profile of the person whose profile you're checking now. So it shows you what they enjoy doing and what comes naturally to them, patiently waiting in line here. Uh, what language to use when speaking to them, what motivation factories you can use, and how to work with them better. <coughs> and then you can go into a full profile that will give you even more details on the same topics of information. So seeing uh, how to vary the messaging, for example, when you're talking to these people. You can see what motivates them. Uh, you can see what language to use in the meeting. Yeah, being rushed is for the person who's going to show me the notes a bit of for my turn right now. And the most important thing from a communications perspective, where I'm coming from, is uh, how to convince them. So you can see what type of persuasion techniques to use on your landing page, or when you're talking to them in an email, or when you're doing a sales pitch, or whatever that might be. And you can get all the other information that we're showing here. Again, that is very creepy if you're on the receiving end of that thing. And I have to say that it's pretty accurate. I've tested it with a bunch of the people I work with in our team. And it's, I would say it's very precise. But it also helps me to know better when going into a meeting with my CEO or my CMO, how to make sure that we both get the best out of that meeting. And obviously you can use all of that to be spammy and hacky and do bad, bad stuff to those people and be uh, trying to use that for selling purposes only. But at the end of the day, if you're not providing the value that you've promised, you're <coughs> not getting anyway. So we need to keep in mind that whatever you promise you need to deliver, otherwise you're going to be in a much bigger mess than where you started from. And the other thing that I want to talk to you about today is uh, something that's already going, again, on a personal and much deeper level, and it's called Jobs to be Done. And it's a framework first presented by Clayton Christensen, who's a Harvard business professor, and he has all these titles and so on. He wrote uh, Innovator's Dilemma, if anyone read it, so that's the same guy. And what we, he figured out was that whenever we are looking at those like demographic factors and psychographic factors and so on, we're not actually getting to the bottom of the situation there. We have no clue on what the person coming to us is trying to achieve. So I can tell you that my target customer is 26 years old female, she's living in Sofia, she has a potential income of whatever amount of Bulgarian land, she uh, likes to frequent these and these types of uh, places, she likes to buy these and these types of brands, 
she would go to these and these media to get her information. But at the end of the day, when I tell you that, you still have no idea why they came to my website in the first place and what they're trying to do. And Job Subicon gets to the bottom of that. So it's a bit weird in terms of phrasing, but what Christensen is getting at is that people hire us for a specific job they want to be done. And uh, there is a lot of um, different competitors that are coming uh, that can solve the same job, so applicants for the same job. Or there are a lot of um, different forces that are trying to get you to a new solution or keep you with your solution you're still using as a user. And what it comes down to is this thing. So we often focus when talking to people on the use. So we tell people, okay, you're getting a screwdriver because you want to screw something on the wall. But we're rarely getting at the actual outcome, which can be putting stuff on the wall where uh, that piece of paint is, or um, putting something on the wall to express my creative side, or putting something on the wall to make my tiny, horrible office space feel a bit more pleasant. And these can all be different jobs. And when you understand that, you can go after different messaging, you can present your product in a different way, or your service or your solution, and you can um, even change features to make sure that your product fits with the end outcome that the person is trying to get at. And here's a very classical example of what that looks like in a real life situation. So we have Snickers on the one hand side, and you have Milky Way. And for the Bulgarians, that Milky Way looks weird, but that's what Milky Way is in the US. It's basically our version of the Mars bar. So what the guys at Snickers were trying to figure out was how to better present the product. And they started evaluating it against competitors. And at first you would feel that Milky Way is a pretty decent competitor to Snickers. After all, it's the same form factor. It has basically almost the same ingredients. It is uh, presented uh, at the same place in the uh, retailer, in the shopping mall. And uh, it's basically a chocolate dessert, like what is there to think about it? But what they found out during the interviews was that people consume Milky Way in a way that you would consume most desserts. So, uh, you would go have it at the end of a rough day where you feel you need some reward for surviving. Or you would get it at the end of the day for congratulating yourself on a big win or just when you need something sweet. But people would go and buy Snickers for a totally different reason. And the reason there would be to satisfy hunger when they're on the go and maybe they missed lunch and they're trying to rush off to their next meeting and they need something quick that's going to give them that boost of energy. So if you look at it from that point, Snickers and Milky Way are not competitors anymore. Snickers can look at competitors in terms of like a banana or roll nuts or a burrito that's easy to eat while you're driving and commuting to your next meeting or something completely different than another dessert bar. And uh, what sneakers can then do is change their messaging to represent that. And I'm guessing a couple of people are already smiling, so we probably figured out what I'm going to show next. Which is their campaign, you're not you when you're hungry. Which is getting at that same point, and it started from that same insight. And it's a way to get to the bottom of what the person is trying to do when they're getting your product or they're looking at your solution. And what you need to do then is get that all information all in one place and uh, make sure that you have an easy, actionable way of reminding yourself who your persona is, who your buyer is, or who your target user is. And the easiest way to do that is what use what we call buyer persona templates. And these look something like this. 
So you would have like a fictional photo or a fictional name for that persona. You would have all the demographic information that you've extracted. You would have their, like what their work looks like, what their influences are, like what are the media they use, the celebrities they follow, the brands they use, and so on. All of that you can extract from the tools I showed you at the beginning. Uh, you would get some of the information about their personality and interests from psychographic research. Uh, you can do that not only by like stalking people online, but also after talking to them. There's very good solutions to get psychographic information based off on actual surveys you can give users. And what you can also do is add that um, job they're looking to succeed in and then marry the two bits, so the, the quantified side and the qualitative information that you got from interviews with users if you're using the jobs to be done framework. And you can then, I run real quickly through jobs to be done, but there's also stuff there called hiring criteria, so what types of benefits people are looking for and what things they have in mind before beginning their research for a new solution. You can look at the benefits, what anxieties they have, again, coming from that same research, like what's kind of bugging them when choosing your product or what might be an issue when they're looking to buy. And you can then use that information to answer those questions in a landing page or in a blog post or whatever. And you can then look at the competitors. And you can look at the competitors following that uh, jobs to be done methodology, so look at not just your direct uh, same solution type of competitors, but look at different types of competitors that might not come to mind straight away. And the reason you do that is that those two slides will ideally sit at your desk and you'll go through them with your team um, every month or every couple of months or with your client when deciding on a new design for their website, or when creating a landing page, or whatever that might be. And you would try to put yourself in the shoes of that person and see if the information that they will see on your website or in your, on your stand at WordCamp Sophie if you're a sponsor of an event or whatever, would be information that will convince them that you're the right fit. So that's how we get all this information in one much more actionable thing than just putting on pages and pages of long explanation and screenshots of solutions that I showed earlier. So yeah, that's basically it. That's all I had to say. First off, you can find the slides at this link. And over there, you can find and download that same buyer persona template that I showed. And you also find a blog post I wrote on the same topic that will maybe you can go over in a couple of days when you've completely forgotten what you heard in this presentation. And I would very much like any questions that you might have now or on Twitter. And also, since she already mentioned that I'm a huge fan of stickers, I brought some from the office. I stole them. <coughs> Don't tell anyone. Uh, so, even if you're not willing to raise the question now, I'll be here during the coffee break so you can come grab a sticker, ask a question, do whatever. Thanks. There's um, an option to start with the audience that's already fans of your page. But what I started with here was a button that's titled everyone on Facebook. 
and then you select the potential criteria. So, for example, if you're doing uh, a coffee shop, uh, you can select interests around coffee, or if you're looking to create like an entrepreneurship academy, you would select something like that. And then uh, Facebook allows you to look at an aggregate of all their users within that specific location that you chose and based off of those interest criteria. So you don't need an actual starting point like your own space or your own website. So that's the first thing, to get some basic idea about the qualitative stuff, side of stuff. And then what you can also do is create surveys and try to get potential users to answer them. So that's a whole different presentation in itself, but you can do that with a potential audience. And once you get that information from Facebook, you would be able to create a short, like an ad, or you can post it in uh, Facebook groups that are focused on your audience and ask people, okay, like here's a short survey, here's like five questions that I really appreciate you answering. Try this out, and that would be the best way of doing it. The caveat there is that uh, we usually go to the, a convenience sample, so people we have easy access to, and that's a very bad idea if your target group is more materially different from what you have access to. So for example, when we were starting Enhancive, uh, we didn't look at the Bulgarian audience because our way of creating your CV is much different than what a US person would think when doing their CV. So we looked at uh, the US market because otherwise our product would have looked totally different and would have wouldn't have served the same needs. So make sure that those interviews are done with people who are as close as possible to our, your target segment. So uh, there's a solution called Hotjar, which is very convenient for this type of uh, like quick pop-up service, or you can do something more substantial if you have the budget. But yeah, that's that's a big if. <laughs> Like to get the full information you have to pay, but it's 
it can give you a lot of information and it can even help you survey competitor sites. So you can see what places they get their bulk, the bulk of their traffic from. So that's also another solution that you can try. The, the left hand, like, uh, I mean, on your end, it's the right hand side of the audience is much uh, more engaged. insights so you can access it completely on your own uh, and uh, the rest of the, st the stuff there uh, Google Analytics and um, LinkedIn website demographics just requires a snippet of tracking code installed on your platform to work uh, the uh, tool that I showed for a psychographic analysis they let you sign up and use like five credits so basically survey five profiles completely free and then you have to pay by profile you want to survey um, so there are solutions that you can use for free and be smart about it we are in my day-to-day -day work I'm rarely using tools that are paid to do this type of research anyone on that side of the Okay, I guess you guys want to get your coffee, and if you need me for anything, I'll be here, and again, come get some stickers, they're super awesome, I promise. <laughs>